We are literally knocking it out of the park for today's episode of CMS Connected. Lisa Welchman is going to be joining us to be discussing web governance. Amy Martin will be talking about SharePoint 2016. We have the news, we have the CMS Insider, and it's all coming to you from right here at Fenway Park. Welcome to the CMS Connected Show, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. I'm your host, Tyler Piper, and to my left, as always, my man, my co-host, Scott Lewer from Digital Clarity Group, and we are coming to you today from the home of the historic Boston Red Sox, the most historic ballpark in all the world, except for maybe <laughs> except besides for Wrigley. Wrigley Field's your cubbies. Yes, exactly, except for that. Pretty cool little place where we're right now, though. Can we do it? the next one at Wrigley? No, it's really awesome. Yeah. I mean, this, this environment is great. Uh, I, you know, having gone to school here in Boston, I have a little bit of an affinity for the Red Sox. <laughs> and we used to be, you know, before they started winning 10 years ago, we used to be kind of kindred we spirits. We kind of felt each other's pain in we a sense. We did, but, but now you don't feel my pain anymore. No, not at all. I mean, we're that's all right. basically a dynasty at this point, so that's all I'm going to leave with that. But anyways, let's move on. Let's talk we about the, the today's end. topic. We've got a great one lined up for you today. Our featured topic is actually going to be managing content chaos with digital governance with special guest Lisa Welchman. She's great. She's been on the show before. She's going to be giving us her take on reaching the next level through the discipline of digital governance solutions. Scott, good topic today for sure. I think that people are really going to enjoy it. I mean, Lisa's been on the show before. We've had some really good conversations, but I think today's topic in particular is, is, a, is a solid one. Yeah, and I think it's it's fitting that we talked about digital transformation the last, the last week, um, or the last month rather, yes. and it's very appropriate to say one of the first kind of sub pieces of that is let's talk about how you get it done with the people and with the culture and the notion of governance because that really is the kind of biggest, that has the biggest stranglehold on effectiveness of these transformations for sure. No question. Also joining us on the show just a little bit later, we have another installment of our Vendor Spotlight with Amy Martin and her review of SharePoint 2016. We talked about it a little bit during our last episode. Amy's going to be breaking it down as an interviewer herself later on in the episode. Now ending the show today as always, insights from our CMS Insider who will be discussing Microsoft's bid to acquire LinkedIn for $26.2 billion. But before we begin, we have to acknowledge our CMS Connected Lee's sponsor who really make this entire show happen. Now with offices in Dallas, Philadelphia, Seattle, Toronto, and Victoria, digital experience agency Falcon Software provides you with solutions for all your content, creative design, content management, e-commerce, CRM, and digital marketing needs. And as of course, Digital Clarity Group, a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. With all that in mind, Let's get right into the top headlines and the top news story. Salesforce buys its way into e-commerce. Now, earlier this month, CMS Connected actually reported on Salesforce buying its way into e-commerce with the Demandware acquisition. Now, the largest deal in history for $2.8 billion in cash. Now, quote, Demandware is an amazing company the global cloud leader, the multi-billion dollar digital e-commerce market, said uh, Mark Benioff, chairman and CEO of Salesforce, saying, continuing saying, with Demandware, Salesforce will be well positioned to deliver the future of e-commerce as part of our customers' successful platform and create yet another billion dollar cloud. So Scott, kind of give me an overview of this, if you will. Sure, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is, first of all, I'm bullish on this, on this deal. I think this is a great move, um, but to summarize, that you mentioned the, the, the big particulars here, $2.8 billion. Um, the revenue in 2015 was about $237 million, however. Now, a lot of that was recurring revenue, which is wonderful subscription. However, that's a 13X, uh, that's a 13X multiplier. Yeah. And so many will point at Benioff and say, well, he really stretched here, he really overpaid. Um, typically, you see, you know, seven to nine X or something like that. And so people say that he's paid a billion dollars, maybe more than yeah. he necessarily needed to, and that somebody must have been there driving that up. I think what he gets in Demandware, however, is um, 
first of all, a big client base. There's a lot of clients that they have. Second of all, it's a big, big B2C player in the commerce business. And so to go and pair that up, uh, an e-commerce platform that's big in the B2C space, to pair that up with a CRM platform, I think is a really good notion. We can criti critique that a little bit, and we yeah. will in the coming moments, but I think that's a great at the outset. Well, I was going to say, one of the things we talked about off-camera is you said you have a theory about this. You have a theory, you know, kind of what really happened here. Explain that to me a little bit more. Yeah, so my theory is, and we've talked about this, and by the way, um, Jill Finger Gibson wrote about this on our website, on DCG's uh, website, but um, my theory is a little bit different. Folks say that Adobe must have been the ones driving this up because those are the two big players yep. here that are kind of building out this marketing ecosystem um, that have yet to really both buy, jump on a, on a, on a commerce platform. Uh, my answer though is I actually don't think so. I think that this was Microsoft was probably the bidder. Um, and I think that, um, in fact, the LinkedIn deal only fuels me to think, to believe that even further. The reason I think so is if we, if, if we think back just a couple of years ago, Nadella, or it was 18 months ago, Nadella tried to bid uh, for Salesforce. He tried to buy Salesforce. And at the time, Benioff um, basically asked for $15 billion more. I wouldn't doubt, you know, to go get, go like this and go overpay so much that Benioff went to his board and basically said, listen, I can get us that extra money if I get what Nadella really wants so badly, which is this commerce platform. We all know that what Microsoft is trying to do is build up their CRM thing. They're kind of viewed many times now in the cloud, at least, as second in line with their Dynamics platform. So I think they, too, were looking for the demandware platform as to kind of get them there. And they had a very big um, B2C base of customers as well. So I think this was Benioff uh, trying to fend off Nadella. Um, the thing that I say to support that is we've also heard in that LinkedIn deal that in fact it was Benioff that outbid, that bid up Nadella. We'll talk about that later, okay. but that's come out actually since then, since okay. this information. Very interesting, very interesting for sure. Let's move on though, let's talk about Amazon because Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos who's uh, bought the Washington Post with $250 million of his personal fortune in August 2013, has led the once proud newspaper into the digital future through developing the digital content management system called Arc Publishing. Now today his efforts uh, appear to be paying off as the Post has recently announced the 11th outside news operation beside eight university papers in the U.S. who pay for its in-house CMS suite, saying, quote, I'm a huge fan of leaning into the future. I don't know anything about the newspaper business, said Bezos, the creator of Amazon, who purchased the struggling newspaper last year at a media conference. But I, I did know something, quote, about the internet that combined with the financial runway that I can provide is the reason why I bought the post. Talk about this a little bit more, Scott. There's kind of two sides to this in a sense, and obviously we'll get into the CMS industry, what it means for that as well. Sure, yeah, that being the second. The first side being just the interesting notion that you can take this 137-year-old organization <laughs> that was really struggling, as frankly all their competitors are as well, in a newspaper industry, trying to figure out how they can be relevant in this digital world and working out various business models for that. So the, I think the really interesting thing is here's a guy who admittedly doesn't know anything about this business, yeah. and I think that's actually his advantage here is coming in and saying you know I don't know anything about this so all questions are on the table I make no assumptions walking in let me go use data insight and the power of understanding what the audience is looking for by reading reading their cues that they're gonna give us so in fact what he's done is thrown more cash into this Basically, he gave, I think, all Amazon's Prime subscribers six months of free access, basically, because he wants to build it up, certainly to beat the New York Times, but also just to get a really good understanding of what does the new customer looking for from the paper. So I think, it's, I think um, the turnaround of the post is a really interesting thing to watch. It's not about the content space, though. Yeah, I think that's a different side. Well, let's talk about the other side, the, the content management industry. What does this actually mean? I, mean, I just rat off some of those yeah. numbers about as far as you know, universities and the number of other pub publications. Yeah. Talk about what this really means for the CMS industry itself. You know, there, so many times when we work with customers, they come to us and say, well, our needs are so unique because, and I listen to them, and while there are certainly some idiosyncrasies of some businesses, for the most part, everyone's challenged with, everyone has the same challenges. The publishing industry, however, does have very specific nuances that typically aren't actually very well met uh, by the CMSs of today. Um, they have some real challenges with, I mean, think about distribution and the notion of the, the, the business models that they have with ads versus paywalls and all of that, the varying revenue streams that they have, versioning, just all of that. Um, they have some real challenges that it looks like 
his creation of this ARC publishing uh, custom platform um, and the fact that they've been able to kind of really get some good traction both within the, with their own journalists but also with these, as you mentioned, 11 other newspapers, I think, and eight universities is a really interesting thing and it'll be interesting to see where he takes that. Certainly he can afford to support that for a while while it gets its legs under it to see if it can uh, push it out into the market. The we might be evaluating ARC Publishing pretty soon I was as gonna a platform. Say, it probably is going to be evaluated very soon. Uh, the last question, how much do you love him literally coming out and saying, I know nothing about the newspaper industry, but I know a little bit about the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing, considering that he dominates the yeah, internet. exactly. <laughs> Absolutely love that. All right, let, let's move on. There was actually big news in the content marketing industry this month as UBM, a London-based global organizer of the B2B events and marketing, um, acquired the Content Marketing Institute for 17.6 million plus performance bonuses. Interesting stuff for sure. Now, the Content Marketing Indus Institute is the foundation of content marketing industry launched by Joe Paluzzi, often nicknamed the godfather of content marketing. Scott, what does the acquisition mean for the future of Content Marketing Institute as well as the content marketing industry? I mean, I know you're very close to this, obviously. Yeah. You talk I'm really curious about your insight into this. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I've known Joe since back when this was Junta 42, as he was, is what CMI was. It was the predecessor, and certainly uh, we share, you know, one of our analysts is Robert Rose, who yep. is also the chief strategy officer here. So, I know a lot about the organization. I've never worked in it, though. And, um, you know, I, I think what Joe said actually as a part of this press release is right, which is that we still are kind of at the dawn of content marketing, which is amazing seeing how far it's already come when we were just defining it a little bit ago. Um, but, you know, look, I'm just really kind of proud of what these guys have all done. Uh, their model, they went out and they found a topic uh, that, look, if you can, anything, if you can get a bunch of marketers and passionate about something and that becomes yep. the thrust of your business, you're going to do pretty well yeah. because you've got an awful lot of advocates out there Let who are pretty push. good at advocating, Let them drive. right? That's what they yeah. do. Exactly. So that's what he did. And from the blog, which is just relentless in terms of its constant production of new and great ideas, which is hard to imagine that they're still going to have them, but through a group of people who are oftentimes only part-timers who are writing, you know, and providing content through to their event, which has just really, I mean, just, I don't know the numbers in terms of how it's multiplied, but it's grown significantly. Uh, and then he's actually made a couple of acquisitions of events, and it's just really been great to watch this. And Joe will stay at the helm for a while, and I know that it'll continue to thrive, and I'm just really excited for them. No, let me ask you this. There are literally millions of blogs out there about content marketing. You can, Probably, yeah. I mean, tons of them. Can anyone rival them at this point? I mean, can anyone you think can come up and actually start to compare or are they just so much out in the forefront? Oh, look, I mean, uh, Joe is really passionate about content marketing. Yeah. Um, UBM, I don't know how passionate UBM is about content marketing. So the degree to which they give Joe the freedom to continue to do what he does really well, to continue to, you know, the degree to which they continue to embrace the brand that he has built so much. I mean, the guy only has orange in his closet. I, <laughs> that's actually a true story. Um, not completely, but for the most part. Um, y you know, Definitely. There's room for others to come in here. I don't know that anybody would try, though, to be honest, yeah. because they are kind of the kings of the hill. And to be honest, how big of a market can it really be? I mean, yeah. to say that there are a lot of blogs from it, they're not necessarily money-making blogs yeah. or even attempting to try to make money, um, per se. It's just something that people are impassioned about. And again, you get a bunch of marketers are impassioned about something, and you're going to find a lot about it. Let them do the talking for you. Absolutely. Works, right. All right, let, let's move on. Now, Berlin-based uh, Contentful, the API-driven content management developer platform, announced it has secured 16 points $8 million to help open up offices here in the U.S. Now, quote, traditional CMS like WordPress or Drupal have uh, been designed to be great for desktop websites but are not architected for other devices and platforms, said founder and CEO of Contentful, adding, we are alleviating those hurdles to make life easier for developers and more productive for companies. So, Scott, what impact will Contentful have in the coming have coming over to the kind of into the U.S. marketing space, coming here. Well, how's this going to happen? Look, the time is right. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm jealous. Uh, he started in 2014. And he's already, and, and they've already you know raised 17 million dollars. But um, 
I think that the timing is right because right now Omnichannel is on everyone's minds. I was and say, why are these guys getting so much attention? Is that because it. of I the think Omnichannel? that's it. I think it is the Omnichannel thing. If you look at even Drupal, when you talk about Drupal a lot more, yep. there's this notion of headless Drupal, which is coming out a lot, which is yep. the idea that we're going to separate concerns again, which I, I mean, there are folks like Dean Barker out there who just published a great book on web content management, by the way, plug for him. But um, who we've been talking about separation of concerns forever, content from presentation, but kind of in the last seven years or so, these kind of baked, fully baked systems um, became much more in the throes and it became less about having this distribution notion. And now it's going back to where it was before mm -hmm. because of the idea of just like they mentioned with mobile and you think about uh, devices like this, right? Where it's basically any glass you're trying to put it up on. The idea of making content management easy before was how can we allow the person who's adding the content to work in the environment that's going to look like what they ultimately are producing, right? Which makes a lot of sense when you're just producing content for the web. However, when it takes its different forms, that actually becomes a hindrance because now you've created content in a way that it fits really well on a web page, but it doesn't do well elsewhere. So what they've done is tried to tap into that idea. Um, and to be honest, many of the big, um, Big, big vendors are trying to do the same thing now is go back to that idea. I, I, I think though the challenge is developers typically are not the buyers. Yeah. And so even you, you hear these kind of true content managers and content strategists talking about headless, but they don't yet have the buy-in of the marketer who's in the room, who has to be at the demo, who doesn't yet realize, oh, wait a minute, that means I don't get preview? because you wouldn't in an environment like this. So there are some real kind of bells and whistles that have sold and made it, brought it to the forefront that can allow line of business to basically make the buying decisions and be the ones using the systems. This takes it back a step, so I'm not so sure how that will fare. Enough. Now, meanwhile, let's go ahead and move on and talk about earlier this month because CMS Connected interviewed DCG's Kathy McKnight. Great interview to discuss what the future holds for Marketo's business, customers, and competitors. Now, after the marketing automation provider goes private with almost $1.8 billion acquisition by Vista. Now, Chairman and CEO of Marketa, Phil Fernandez, said, quote, after careful consideration and deliberation, our board of directors unanimously concluded that the sale of Marketo to Vista Equity Partners was in the best interest of Marketo and its shareholders. Now, Scott, this is something we actually, we talked about this last month a little bit, and it's interesting for Marketo. Why does this really make sense for them right now? Look, I think the part of the catalyst for Marketo getting into this was that it was really difficult to be the standalone marketing automation platform out there fighting against the likes of Salesforce, that has a, who has a couple of them, Oracle, Adobe, who all have other revenue streams that can, they can afford to basically drop their price to make sure that they don't lose a deal to Marketo. And poor Phil, uh, who's sitting at the helm there, he doesn't have that same ability to go and drop his price so easily without it affecting cash flow in a significant way. So, look, you already in a cloud-based business, you need deep pockets, right? Because we've talked about this before. We talked about it even when we were talking about the Sitecore yep, deal. Exactly. That you need to have deep pockets to be able to go and fuel that because your customer acquisition cost is high. However, in a case like this, Again, without those other revenue streams, he was really finding it difficult um, to go it alone. And the other reason why this makes sense is because, to be honest, there weren't that many buyers left that uh, are without a marketing automation platform that could even afford to go and pay this sort of money. I mean, $2, two billion is an awful lot of money to go pick up a marketing automation platform, and really there weren't many players left to be able to go and buy it. So they had to go find a private equity Same firm. Thing. So how does this affect some of their current users right now? Some of the yeah. folks that are actually already using Marketo. Does this affect them at all? Look, Vista doesn't have the greatest reputation in the world of its companies continuing to innovate. Um, they tend to kind of say we can make money by right-sizing the, the organization itself a little bit, realigning the top, you know, the top and maybe bring in their own people, um, cutting spend, that sort of stuff. So that doesn't usually say a whole lot for innovation. Um, so, but that being said, look, 
the, the, the good news for customers is that most of them, in fact, were only in these one-year renewable contracts, which means barrier to exits are not very high, to be honest. And I'm sure that's one of the things that Vista is going to come in and make them throw a lot at them, getting them in these three years, four years lock-in deals yeah, for good say, prices. Is that a scary thing, though, right now? I mean, could there be a mass exodus given it's the a, small? It's a very scary thing. So they have to be very tepid about their approaches and how they go and lock those lock, lock those customers in. I would absolutely say yes. Okay. It was one of the great appealing things of Marketo to, to many customers, but it's also now, it's I think it's a, it's a big threat for someone like um, Vista. They need to go and shore that up. So for customers though, I think it's good. They can kind of wait and see a little bit. They can talk to ownership and find out, but there's also certainly plenty of other options that are out there. What about prospects? How does this affect them? Because prospects, they don't have that yeah. very appealing thing like you just said of, oh, I can go in for a year good and test question. it out. Right? You don't know where it's going to go. I think that that's a it's a very good question. Um, I, I have always really liked the platform. Um, uh, Kathy, who you spoke with earlier, really likes the platform too. So they're bullish on that. So features, functions wise, again. But would I go lock myself into a long term deal? I'm not so sure that I would do that super soon. I'd kind of want to do a wait and see. So go ahead if you're already in the in the midst of um, you know talking to them. If you're already a prospect and you're going through that process, continue to do your due, due diligence. You have a few other questions to answer um, now. But I think you've also got uh, you know, a lot of bargaining chips because they need you <clears throat> right now. They've got to go and prove out this deal. So I think they'll be hungry to go to, to uh, make sure that the customers are satisfied. Interesting. Very good stuff. He is Scott Lee. I am Tyler Piper. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back in just a second where we talk digital governance with Lisa Welshman. Don't go anywhere. You're watching CMS Connected. So you've got a great website. Your marketing team spends hours driving visitors to it and nurturing them into leads. And your sales team spends hours collecting, qualifying, organizing, and chasing those leads. Sales wants to focus on what they do best selling, and marketing wants to get on with what they do best, creating innovative campaigns. But how do you make both teams happy? The solution is marketing automation. Welcome back to the CMS Connected Show, the CMS industry's only news commentary show. I'm your host, Tyler Pivot, along with Scott Lewer from Digital Clarity Group, and we are coming back to you from the oldest ballpark in Major League Baseball, Fenway Park. Uh, talk all you want about digital transformation, meanwhile, at the end of the day, it takes good digital governance to get the job done right. Now, few organizations realize this because they're distracted by either internal politics or bury, buried out in left field. Literally, that's where we're sitting right now, basically out in left field in the technology first approach. Now, with that well-placed pun, haha, of course, let me introduce our special guest for today's show and author of Managing Chaos Digital Governance by design, Lisa Welshman. Welcome back to the show, Lisa. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing very well. Good. Now, I have to ask you before we really get into this, you're an Orioles fan. How do you feel about being <laughs> here in you know, Fenway? Uh, to be honest with you, I feel a little dirty, but <laughs> hey, uh, let's just go with it. I love that dirty water. <laughs> Boston, you're my home. That's the way the song goes. That's, That's okay. okay. All right, so Lisa, kind of delve into it first off. Well, Talk about how organizations can reach the next level by kind of realigning people, content, technology, and improved governance. And the first question I kind of have for you is just talking about digital governance and why is it so important? Why is digital governance so important? Well, when I think about digital governance and digital in general and digital transformation, digital governance is sort of the first cause of a good digital transformation. You can't really do anything holistically across the organization unless you've aligned all of your people. So what digital governance really focuses on is getting your digital team straightened out and sort, sorted out so that they can do all those spectacular things that you want to do online. I think a lot of times organizations are trying to do things that are really quite sophisticated and involve collaboration across every single silo of the organization, mm. but they have no idea who those people are, how they work together, and they're just not aligned around a common strategy. So digital governance really helps pull that all together and then after that you can sort of do whatever you want. Hmm. I mean it's it's so funny we we constantly talk about this idea of digital transformation and I'm I sat with a group of CMOs last week who by the way I don't think are at the helm of digital transformation necessarily um, but the biggest struggle that they all have is the culture issue, is the people issue, right? And so I think everybody recognizes that this is something. You mentioned though you talked about the digital team 
How about the fact that transformation, though, permeates kind of throughout the entire organization? What, what's the kind of role of that digital team versus kind of us trying to establish governance mechanism across, since it affects everyone sure. and we're becoming a more digital organization? The role of, can you talk about the role of the digital team versus kind of the rest, juxtaposed to the rest of the organization? Sure, well, there's two things about that, really. One is that the digital team's actually much larger mm -hmm. than people think. When mm -hmm. everyone says digital team or web team or whatever right. it is inside of an organization, they're usually thinking about that central group of people that get in trouble if something goes wrong online, mm -hmm. right? There's somebody that you can kind of point to right. that are the ones that get in trouble and they can, you know, wave the flag and say, yay, if something goes well, um, too. But the digital team is really quite extensive. It includes that central core of people that are sort of the enabling arm. They set the policies and the standards and the strategies. They set up web content management systems and all types of horizontal collaboration platforms and anything that's sort of like the underlying technical stack that supports mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. content strategy, any of those things that really have to be comprehensive taxonomy, you can list them on and on. But then there's also another layer of the digital team, which is your distributed team. Mm -hmm. That aspect of the team are just sort of makers. They're people who are out in various business silos. They might be making mobile apps, managing content, authoring content, doing all sorts of things that usually make that central team really annoyed because they're they're the <laughs> ones that might sort of go <laughs> off the ranch yeah, and yeah, yeah and do their yeah. own, do their own thing. But they're also part of the team. Then you've got all these working groups that spin up around you know various standards groups or projects or any sorts of initiatives that might happen. You have groups that spin up around figuring out what the digital budget is. Mm. There's all these sorts of executive level to tactical level horizontal groups in the team. And then even beyond that, there's your extended team, which is really um, you know, anyone outside of your organization that somehow enables digital. And so that could be a vendor who's implementing your content management system. Sure. It could be an interactive agency. Some people almost completely outsource production of their website to an extended mm -hmm. team with a small core. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the thing that people don't understand. It's a huge team. Yeah. And if you don't know who these people are, there's no way you can communicate to them. Right. And so that's really an important piece. Gotcha, that makes a lot of good sense. N now with that mind, so given the place that we're at right now, let's talk about baseball in general. We talk about like Major League Baseball to me is a really interesting kind of case study right there because you've got, you're dealing with 32 teams. You're dealing with all of their minor league teams and all of these teams that are continuing to publish content. Where do you start in something like that when an organization is so broad and so deep? Well, that's really interesting because when you use an analogy like Major League, League Baseball, it's actually a really quite interesting one because there's that you know, central hub of Major League B Baseball and there's certain rules and regulations that you have to follow if you're part of that entity. But then each team has their separate identity. And so that's not diff quite different than um, when an organization might have you know multiple brands like say you're a company and then you have different candy brands or something something like Hershey or something like that you've got different candy bars yeah. that have different brands to them so they're very different so that's a very sophisticated type of governing mechanism and governing model where you want to have some shared standards and some that are distributed or dispersed and so you have to start by understanding what's shared and what's different and that's really yeah. the key to governance and then after that you can kind of do what you want within that framework and even more so, the team analogy is important because I often use um, the wrong approach to digital governance as being one where you sort of go out on a field and you, with a bunch of your friends and you look at each other and you say, let's play a game. And then you just start. That's sort of how people manage digital. No one says, what game is it? Right. What are the rules? And more importantly, who's playing what position? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have all of that stuff defined before you start because you can imagine you know, what would happen if, you know, got out on the field yeah. and started playing baseball with no rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. just go ahead and That's play. not the way the Orioles do it. You they know <laughs> what they're doing. <laughs> I feel like at some point I've got to bring in my Cubs fan. Cubs, yeah. I'm a Cubby <laughs> here, so um, both of you still feel bad for me right now, but that's all right. Uh, this is our year. Um, you've actually said to me, related to that point, uh, more than once, and I've repeated this as I often do, and I give you no credit for it whatsoever, um, that <laughs> governance is actually freeing. I think you gave me an analogy that if, you know, once you put up a fence around your yard, to be able to tell your kids you've got all this space is actually much more freeing uh, and l liberating than if they don't have any fence posts and you're kind of constantly watching them, that sort of a thing. Is that, is that valid still here too in the sure. same in the same Sure, and it's, it's freeing for everyone. It's freeing for the people who are making things. So those folks out in the distributed team that are actually putting things online, understand what the parameters are, but it's also 
really freeing for the organization because they don't have to constantly monitor. Mm -hmm. Like once you put up the fence, which could be things like templates in a CMS yeah. or anything else that actually processes that keep the, the standards in place and the policies in place, once you've got that in place, you don't have to be checking all the time, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times that central uh, digital team is really wants to think that governance is about reviewing every single thing that goes online, but that doesn't have to be the case. Mm -hmm. It can be making sure that you have processes and policies and standards that are in place so that when people are creating content and information, they're doing it in a standards compliant environment. Can right? you just define quickly, because I'm not sure that all of us know, I know that you th see big differences maybe between standards versus, uh, can, you, can you define some of those sure. for us a little bit? The simple way is that policies are really organizationally focused. So you put a policy in place to protect the organization from things like litigation or to help support the brand, mm -hmm. but it's all about the organization, mm -hmm. right? And making sure that you don't get sued and making sure that you're, when you're out there online, you look the way you're supposed to and to the best advantage. Sure. Standards are more about what you're making, right? So is what you're making of quality? Does it have a good information architecture? Is the user experience good? So the standard is focused more on the product that you're creating. And so that's the primary difference. There's future, usually fewer policies and they change less frequently. Mm -hmm. And there's more standards and they change more often because the technology around is changing. And is guidelines a third one or is it just synonymous with standards? No, guidelines are different than standards. Guidelines are really sort of like best practices. Okay. They're either you want to make something a guideline either because there's really no way to check compliance with it or because it's really difficult to check compliance with it. Things for content people, that's like voice and tone. Mm -hmm. So you might have a recommendation and say, we want to sound friendly, mm -hmm. um, we want to be easy to understand, but how do you really check for that without looking at every yeah, single line? Something like that's not even feasible, right? When we get right. to the scaling up But part. you want to write some guidelines so that, and then you want to hire well so that you've got guidelines and then people who do their job well, and then hopefully you'll get in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So you brought up, Tyler, you brought up the analogy to baseball, which is fitting, of course, but I actually thought you were going in a little bit of a different direction where I'd like to ask you about this, Lisa, is digital transformation folks see so much as this undercurrent of data, which is now in such vast abundances within organization. And given the money ball scenarios yep, where I thought absolutely. you were going with the baseball thing, but how much it's changed given all of this access to data, folks. But but there is still, when when we when I've run groups, as I was in Austin last week, ran a group, and it was specifically talking about, well, the challenge they have is who owns the data? How do they align that data? Um, you know, where does it reside? Is it, the, is it a similar problem to content? Do you see it as different? Uh, is it the same solution from a governance standpoint when it comes to data or no? What are your thoughts about that? I'm stretching a little bit. I think there are some similarities and I can maybe talk about them separately. The, the data piece is really interesting because honestly, when it comes to data and tangential, tangentially digital analytics as well, mm -hmm. I, I just think organizations are quite immature mm -hmm. and it's mostly because they can't get their hands on it. Most people, I mean, so you don't even know where your digital team is. You know where your systems are, but there's no consistency about how the data is gathered, how it's aggregated. Right. It's Definitely. very hard, and it wasn't, the data being gathered was not architected as a system. So I think there's just a really, really long way to yeah. go with that piece. And I think people can do sort of backwards analytics and look at data sets and claim to have some conclusions about things. But um, I think it's going to be, you know, another good 10 years before yeah. we really start sort of doing that because you need to engineer for that data. I would imagine that's a near front, near term frontier for digital governance has got to be getting your arms around that or helping organizations sure. to kind of tackle that problem. After sure, certain. but you ha need to get the people straight first because they're Absolutely. the ones that are putting yeah. the systems together. There's and hoarding yeah, yeah. Yeah. and it just alignment is required. Yeah. And doesn't matter. Absolutely. And, and a strategic objective. I mean, there's a plethora of data out there that you can actually gather and look at, but what's important to gather and look at, right? Sure. You have to know what that is. On the other hand, content's been around forever, and there's a lot of content online that used to exist in a print format mm -hmm. that's been put on in PDFs. It's just there's unstructured content, structured content, content that's almost data because it's yeah. so particular, and so that's a really interesting component of it, and I think what's interesting about that for me is you have people who treat content as a narrative text and then people who create content as data. as data. And I think those two arms really need to move together. And you think about that a lot in the content marketing space sure. of just yeah. how do you push these 
things together and actually get to action that. And you have two different types of players on the team who are working with that. There are people who want to look at data and people who look at content as storytelling. And so if we can pull those two pieces together and get them to understand that there's an alliance, right, and that it's not a competition, then I think sure. we'll be working well. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, let's talk about uh, content ROT actually, and how does better governance actually support the elimination of content ROT? So ROT, ROT, redundant, outdated, trivial content, we've all seen it before, we've all run into it online, and I think the single one thing that good digital governance helps you do is it, it takes you towards content governance, which is really sort of a, a subset of any type of corporate governance which lies around actually the care and feeding of actual content and the team around the content. And so when you've got a lot of rot, it usually means that you're not clear who's on your content team, what they do, and who's supposed to actually manage the full life cycle of the content. Mm -hmm. So historically, we just dumped a lot of content online, and mm -hmm. so up until maybe three or four years ago, I'll give everybody a pass, right? Everybody was just dumping stuff online and putting, okay, we all did the bad stuff, but now you shouldn't be doing that anymore. When yeah. you're putting something online, you should understand when it needs to be edited and when it needs to be removed. And then beyond that, when you start thinking about, you know, uh, digital records retention and, and document retention standards inside your organization, when is it okay to actually destroy that content? inside the organization. So there's this full life cycle around that. And if we understand that aspect of it and are managing it, then you will not have redundant, outdated, and trivial content. Or what you won't have outdated and trivial content. Redundancy actually comes out of the silos, right? Where you have different sure. aspects of the same mm -hmm. business doing the same thing over and over again because they're disjointed. And when that's happening, that usually means that you have a weak core team. That number one team in the middle that writes all the strategies, policies, and standards, and implements those enabling technologies, it means they're not doing their job of sort of overseeing everything and making sure that there isn't redundancy. They're not doing that particularly well, or there's not a particularly unified content strategy. Is this, is this more, though, about fending off a risk or take, leveraging an opportunity? Like, you know, if I had redundant, like what's the downside of having this rot, or what's the upside of not having rot? Like, why is this so relevant? Well, it's relevant because it messes up search. I was going to say the redundancy. I mean, having you're just shooting yourself in the foot right off yeah. the get-go. Yeah, I mean, like, and, and people are, are guessing. I remember many years ago I worked with a client um, in the federal government space, and part of the, the case that we had for selling, a, at that time, just web governance project was redundant, um, content or duplicative content that said slightly different things. Mm -hmm. So it was in a highly regulated environment and mm -hmm. it was difficult to know mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong. Sure. So I think just off the bat, it's just confusing and it's not, doesn't provide a clean and good user experience. Sure, makes sense. Yeah, definitely makes sense. So the, the search thing, I went gone through that with organizations yeah. and it's, it's just an absolute nightmare because you wonder why am I ranking slipping consistently and right. always, then you go back and look, well you've I mean, I know something. inside an organization for certain things yeah. like, I mean, I, I remember even when I was when I was working inside an organization, SharePoint was the death of us, right? Because, mm -hmm. and it's not SharePoint's fault, it's just it became a glorified file share. Yep. And now suddenly people is. felt liberated, and it is, um, people felt liberated to just like, oh, I'll keep this local for us. Mm -hmm. And so they'd, they'd pull down the policy because it might have been more mm -hmm. difficult to find. Mm -hmm. And f finally somebody got their hands on it, so they shared it with their team, and then now that team only looked at that one. Meanwhile, the policy's been updated 10 times and nobody knows that they've got their local version here that nobody's paying attention to what's going on. So I certainly understand um, inside an organization how challenging that is, um, for Well, sure. it takes an incredible amount of discipline, like playing a sport, yep. an incredible amount of discipline to actually manage c that much content. And I think people are just waking up to that, Yeah. right? It's sort of like, you know, anybody can play baseball, but not everybody can play it well, right? So anybody can put up a website, but not everybody's going to do it well. So there's a certain amount of rigor that's involved in getting good at that. And I think organizations just now, and as the antecedent to really being able to start a digital transformation, have to learn how to do that. And, and, I, and I think, you know, to make the data content parallel again, um, there's a real danger. I think we're in this notion of, <laughs> so data, I think one of the dangers of data, data is that people have this mindset around big data now. It used to be capture only what you need, how are you going to use it eventually, and then you're going to make sure it's you know, not garbage in, garbage out. Um, 
Big Data Idea says capture everything, we'll figure it out later because the tools are going to be so powerful that we'll be able to make sense of it all. Meanwhile, we're making these big gigantic landfills of data that are very difficult to deal with. Content, however, I don't think anybody thinks that big content is a good idea, that we're going to be able to make sense of it. I think they've just fallen into the trap, but I don't think anybody, like with data, they're going there intentionally. Like, blindly, but thinking that's going to be an okay thing. But I don't think anybody believes that there's tools and, and things out there to go make sense of big content um, where it, it wouldn't be harmful, right? And this helps you avoid the idea of big content. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't a question. I could, I could disagree with you. I was about to say, I could disagree. Go ahead. I, well, I, like I think there's a that. use case for big content. It's just not in a business. <laughs> okay. Right? So okay. there might be in academia. There's all kinds of reasons where you might actually want that big content set. Things like the Wayback Machine online. Sure. That's just going out and aggregating stuff and aggregating it. But that's more of a historical research focused thing. Most organizations aren't those types of organizations mm -hmm. except maybe higher ed. So a for profit business or even a non profit that's very mission driven, they're probably not gonna want big content. Sure. They're gonna specifically want their content. But I can imagine wanting to leverage that in some use cases. By the way, I don't think big content is a term. I was gonna say, I think you just coined big content. I think we just coined big content. I don't know if it's a good thing I don't or not. Know. But Check that is off. it a term? I don't know. Do you Know it? Nope. I don't know. Maybe. Coin right here. CMS connected, folks. All right. We got one more. I got one more question for you, Lisa. Talk about governance inside an organization. Where do content governance fit in with things like digital governance and IT governance? Because, like you started talking about right there, it is separate in a sense. It is. I mean, content governance is a very, very specific thing. When you look at sort of the digital umbrella, well, let's start at the top. You look at corporate governance. You have fiscal governance. Forever, we've had IT governance. Right, so slotting into that now for me is digital governance, mm -hmm. right? You have this online experience that has to be governed. You have to make sure you're not doing things that are illegal. You have to make sure that you're doing a good and quality job and you understand who's touching what and where. What's really interesting about content governance is content governance you could think of as a subset of digital governance if you were only thinking about digital content. But for organizations, there's also omni-channel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that sort of cuts horizontally mm -hmm. yeah. across the organization. And it's a very, very interesting use case and complex use case because when you think about someone's user journey through content, um, there's an online aspect and an offline aspect. Mm -hmm. There might be a face-to-face -face aspect and yep. it sort of Definitely. weaves through that. And so understanding what that is and actually understanding the full team that supports that and the life cycle for all that information and also understanding whether it should be online, offline, face-to-face -face, or some combination of both. Should it be on a mobile app? Should it be on a website? That's the world of the content governance person. And I think it's a really special world and important world and it's gonna have to align with the data people and everything else as well as people who are traditionally in that digital space working on standards for enabling publishing platforms mm -hmm. and things yeah. like that. So it's a, a real special area. So quickly with your book then, um, just give a quick plug to that and tell us about kind of how do, is this become the reference manual for how to deal with this? Talk about how do you address this sort of stuff in the book then? So Managing Chaos Digital Governance by Design, it's been out for about a year, I'm real excited about that. Yeah. Took me a long time to write it. I think it's been really well received. The way I really see that book is is a first attempt to actually define the space. When we talk about digital governance and governing digital, what's language that we use and mm -hmm. ways that we can describe the problem. Mm -hmm. Because usually when I work with people, I come in and they usually say something like, so and so over there is a jerk, or they won't comply with my standards, <laughs> or they're just like, they're fighting about all kinds of things. And they're talking about it at a project level, like this project is hard, I can't implement my CMS mm -hmm. because these people, IT picked the wrong one or all these other sorts of debates. And that's really interesting, but the reality is they have a governance problem, yeah. which is they didn't use the right methodology for setting the standard for the CMS. Maybe it wasn't as inclusive of, of a group. And so I'm trying to push people from getting away from that sort of combative language and more into understanding you have a problem with your digital team structure and you're probably not clear about who sets strategy, policies, and standards. And if you just stop and have a conversation about this, these other types of things like product selections won't be so difficult because you'll understand who needs to be in the room when that selection is made. And that can actually streamline everything. Mm -hmm. And so that's my hope for it. I really hope that the dialogue is going to broaden and it has. Um, you know, some of the big analyst firms are talking about um, 
that is mm -hmm. digital clarity group sure. is one of them mm -hmm. are discussing digital governance so i hope it's an opening play to actually have a richer conversation about it and to mature the space and talking about discussion where can folks have more discussion with you where do you actually want to be found um, you can find me at lisawelchman.com. That's the easiest way to find me. Um, and I'm always around giving talks all the time. Yeah, very good. Lisa Love, thank you so much for taking time out today. Really Thanks for having it. me. Thank you. For always a pleasure. Out. Definitely. She is Lisa Welshman. We'll be right back. We'll be talking with Amy Martin in just a few seconds right here on CMS Connected. Your job is to cut through the noise. To succeed, you need to reach out to your target audiences in real time with messages that speak to them. You can't let technology get in the way of your brand. That's the spirit. First Spirit is a powerful solution that helps you effectively communicate and engage with your target audience. Get an awesome ROI. Success in the market means your message got through. To the right people, at the right time, in the right way. And that's why you need First Spirit. Get started with digital marketing. Visit www.espirit.com now. Welcome back to CMS Connected. It's time for the Vendor Spotlight, where today we will be reviewing SharePoint 2016. Now, last month, SharePoint unveiled a new cloud-first, mobile-first version at the Future of SharePoint event, which is allowing people, teams, and organizations to intelligently discover, share, and collaborate content from anywhere and on any device. Now, SharePoint plans to implement many new features for this calendar quarter and many more by the end of 2016. Now, here to tell us a little bit more about SharePoint 2016 and their latest innovation is Amy Martin from Falcon Software. Amy, how are you today? I'm good, Tyler, how are you? Hey, I'm filming at Fenway Park. I mean, I'm in my glory day right now. Do you really think there's anything better than this for someone like me right now? <laughs> no, you guys have so much fun. I am like so jealous. Every show you get to, have, you know, last time you were at a distillery, this time you're at Fenway, what's next? <laughs> We've got a little something up our sleeves. Can't tell anyone just yet, but soon enough, I promise you. Anyways, let's talk about SharePoint right now. Of the latest SharePoint 2016 features which have been released and will be released, tell our viewers which ones stand out the most and why. Yes, so there is um, so many features that have just been released with SharePoint 2016 that I wouldn't be able to go over all of them, not in a 10 minute segment. But uh, the ones that are really standing out to me and the ones that are getting people really excited, um, of course number one is the mobile vision that SharePoint came up with at the event. Um, and really this is now coming out with this new touch friendly uh, interface for mobile that people can access SharePoint from anywhere. Uh, people have been waiting for this for a long time and it's finally out there now so good job SharePoint um, I think you know Scott touched on it in our last show that you know good for you SharePoint that you finally caught up but I think people that really utilize SharePoint and use it on a daily basis are just so extremely happy about this um, and also what people can do in the OneDrive for business area is they are now able to access sites and libraries so really be able to really um, get access to everything SharePoint files um, another thing that is, um, has people talking, of course, is the hybrid capabilities, which is p getting people really, really excited. So finally, people can now uh, you know, work in SharePoint 2016 as well as Office 365 uh, simultaneously. And um, I think people need to be aware, though, that this isn't really a true hybrid experience. Um, the word hybrid is getting you know, thrown around so much um, these days and so easily. So people really need to know that, that it's not available just quite yet as a true, true hybrid experience. Um, but what other people have really been waiting for is this whole hybrid cloud search. So really a unified search experience is now going to be available. Um, so people can go through Office 365 and really access everything through on-premise SharePoint search index. Um, but people need to also know that they can only do this through Office 365. Um, some of the infrastructure and performance enhancements that they've done, um, of course, is the zero downtime patching, so people are pumped about that. Uh, no need to take down server farms during your patches now, so that's exciting. Um, increased file size for upload, so um, 
before it was two gigs, now 10 gigs, which is it's not huge, but it's also uh, an enhancement there. And the fast site creation. So now this is a template put in place where uh, with SharePoint 2016 that people can create site collections in one second rather than 40 seconds in SharePoint 2013. Um, and since today we're talking about on the show digital governance, I really wanted to touch on the new capabilities that they've enhanced with their compliance center. So now people can create their own policies and apply those against their environment. Now, Amy, which features have already began to roll out? Yeah, so good point. Um, at the event, the Future of SharePoint event, which happened on May 4th, they did roll out a lot of things that there were coming down the pipeline, um, but as of that day, they did say that SharePoint Server 2016, as well as Office Online Server, it was open to the general availability. Um, and also effective was, of course, the mobile features. So everything for OneDrive for iPhone and iPad, uh, seamlessly you can share and edit. Um, also the new Discover feature through uh, web and Android. So people can now share collectively and edit and everything through their, their mobile devices, which is a big part which I had mentioned, but also to minimize the search time and also they're getting recommendations through Office Graph. Um, now on June 7th, they also announced the new um, modern library, uh, sorry, modern document libraries, which is a big uh, a thing that they just released and people are really excited about, uh, which rolled out for Office 365 and commercial customers worldwide. Now, what I really like about this is the fact that it's offering um, a unified customer experience now through OneDrive Consumer, OneDrive for Business, and SharePoint Document Libraries. So very consistent user experience. Um, they're offering also a new display for folders. They're also offering, um, you can access YouTube and put links and uh, outside sources throughout these folders to keep them in your team sites. And um, they're also offering templates, so you don't have to start from square one with your Word documents and your PowerPoints. Uh, so that saves people a lot of time. But I think you know the game. The thing that people are really excited about, of course, is the fact that you can import files from other libraries. Um, and this also became available for education customers as of June twenty-first. Um, and, but the thing I think is really a game changer for SharePoint, um, and I really got an amazing quote from a fellow in New Zealand, and his, his name is Michael Sampson, he's a SharePoint activist, and he also believes that the game changer for SharePoint is really going to be within Office Graph. And it's already started, and it's really exciting that you know the system, the machine, is becoming smarter than the individual, which is giving you highlights of things that you can work with your projects that's relevant and can complement your projects, offering those recommendations to you. So really this machine intelligence is really going to be a game changer, um, we believe, for um, that's within Office Graph and that's using SharePoint 2016 and Office 365. Now the biggest thing is what people are saying. I mean, you've seen some of the tweets. What are people saying right now about SharePoint 2016? Of course, I know everyone wants to know is are people liking it, are they not liking it? Um, but I think it's just too soon to say. It's only been out for a couple months. Um, nobody's saying I hate it, I love it. Everyone's just really trying to configure it, try to work with it. Um, and that's what people are doing right now. They're really coming out with tutorials, they're coming out with how to's, they're coming out with videos to help other people use it. Um, but, uh, you know, I did find a few things that people were having some configuration issues with SharePoint 2016, but I'm assuming that if you go online, you can get all that resolved. Um, also, I found some really fun posts from people, people that are just jacked about SharePoint, really big enthusiasts. And uh, this one is from Thomas Shelby at uh, King Chip. And his is got SQL training and SharePoint training in the past two weeks. Then I'm learning PowerShell over the summer. The dork in me is excited. <laughs> Just love that. And another tweet that I found that was really funny, um, obviously not to him because he was quite frustrated, uh, but I think people can really relate to this, is a fellow named by Baron Schaff, at Baron Schaff. He points out, hashtag SharePoint, virtual analog to socks in the dryer. It's where your information goes to disappear for no apparent reason. <laughs> which I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, but this morning, just a few hours ago, I had uh, the pleasure of having a great conversation with Mr. David Maffey, which is the CRO from Akumina. Um, I asked him some really detailed questions about SharePoint 2016, and here's what he had to say. 
So David, many people in the industry, including Scott Lewer, our co-host on CMS Connected, really was referring to SharePoint 2016 event as it could have been called the catch-up of SharePoint rather than the future of SharePoint. What is your take? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the reality of it is, is that it's a little bit of both. So you have uh, inside of the SharePoint ecosystem uh, a lot of organizations who have been longing for some of the technology that Microsoft is bringing to bear, uh, almost more so in Office 365 than in SharePoint specifically in 2016. And so I think as you think about how these organizations will evolve their businesses over time and the functionality that they're using inside of SharePoint, the concept is going to be more about how can I get the most out of SharePoint to solve the specific needs that I have. And so I think in doing that, Microsoft has delivered a better framework with more features, with more functions that are solving more real use case needs. There are always going to be people out there that want SharePoint to really do a lot of things that it just doesn't do and really isn't intended to do. Uh, and those people will probably always be disappointed and wanting for it to catch up more. But for those SharePoint purists that are using the system to deliver the way it's supposed to deliver and the functions that it's supposed to have, uh, you know, I think they've seen this as a really big refresh and step forward for SharePoint. So as Microsoft continues with SharePoint 2016, do you think a lot of people are really hopping on board or are they really struggling to catch up? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I think if you listen to Jeff Tieber, who's the corporate vice president of Microsoft uh, in the SharePoint division, you know, he says that there are over a million SharePoint developers at SharePoint customers. There's over 10 million SharePoint developers throughout the total ecosystem, and there are literally hundreds of thousands of customers. SharePoint itself is the single largest and most deployed commercial content management system in the world. In fact, it's even larger if I take all of the other commercial content management systems and put them together, the footprint is still not as wide as SharePoint. So when you talk about trying to catch up and upgrade, you're always going to have stragglers, especially probably in government entities or in really large legacy organizations who aren't going to be as fast to move. I really think that the big change that we're seeing in the industry today and that's only going to accelerate over time is not necessarily the shift from a legacy version of SharePoint to SharePoint 2016, but really from a legacy version of SharePoint to SharePoint Online inside of Office 365 so that they can tap into all of the other intelligence tools that Office 365 brings to bear so that they can get more out of the, the data that sits inside of SharePoint. So what do you think is going to happen with organizations similar to Akumina who really live off the fact that SharePoint is quite complicated and you help with user experience? What is going to happen with these new SharePoint 2016 changes? Do you think it's really going to affect enterprises similar to yourself? Uh, that's a good question. So, so we really view SharePoint as and the other elements of Office 365 that we plug into as the core plumbing of our system. You know, if you look at a traditional uh, web content management firm or enterprise content management firm, 80% of their effort in R&D is spent on trying to figure out the back-end database schema, trying to figure out search and governance, trying to figure out user management and workflows and synchronization technologies. And about 20% is focused on the user experience. When you look at companies like Akuma and some of our competitors, what we really focus on is 100% of our R&D goes into really delivering a much more usable framework to allow for the productivity of business users inside of organizations. So we let Microsoft focus on delivering that 80%, and we focus on delivering 100% of ours as UX. And, and by doing that, what we're ultimately saying is, is that as long as Microsoft continues to evolve SharePoint and mature SharePoint, we're getting better plumbing. And as long as I get better plumbing under the covers, it's just going to only enhance what I'm able to deliver to my customers to allow them to really engage their employees, drive revenue, and really push innovation. So uh, apparently, Amy, you must have thought we were having just a little too much fun with Fenway here because I just saw a wardrobe change in the background and you've got a little addition to that wardrobe. What's this about right here? Yeah. Got to represent. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. You've got to represent your team. That's awesome. But anyways, let's keep talking about SharePoint. Keep that jersey and that hat on right now. You need to. All right, so what I have to ask you, Amy, is really what stands out to you from your conversation with David? 
Yeah, so number one, I think that David made a really good point about um, there are going to be stragglers with SharePoint 2016. Not everyone is going to be, you know, up to date right away, especially with government agencies that have to go through an approval process. Um, and also the fact that he mentioned that, you know, they're not threatened or worried companies that are very similar to Akumina and Akumina, you know, their company. They're not worried about these new features of SharePoint 2016. They're actually excited about them. They're going to leverage them and all Microsoft innovations to really help their customers and you know bring even better user experience. Awesome stuff, Amy. Thank you as always. Go Red Sox, right? No way! I <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Blue Absolutely Jays. love it. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back in just a few seconds with our CMS Insider. So you've got a great website. Your marketing team spends hours driving visitors to it and nurturing them into leads. And your sales team spends hours collecting, qualifying, organizing, and chasing those leads. Sales wants to focus on what they do best, selling. And marketing wants to get on with what they do best, creating innovative campaigns. But how do you make both teams happy? The solution is marketing automation. Welcome back to CMS Connected. I'm Tyler Pivot alongside Scott Lewer and Scott, time for the CMS Insider. But first, we have to acknowledge where we are. I'm a baseball guy. We're in the visiting locker room for the Boston Red Sox. So whatever team they're playing tonight, yeah. they're going to be in here in this just a where few be. hours. Could exactly. Be taking some hacks in here. That's I don't right. know what you, it it kind of smells like sports in here. Doesn't it? <laughs> it has <laughs> that kind of feeling. It's a here. good thing the video hasn't gotten yet to the ability <laughs> of exactly providing the essence of where we are. But no, no, this is pretty amazing that these guys are in here taking batting practice uh, just later this afternoon. Yeah, so well, what's interesting, that's why it's so quiet in here too, so the guys can literally just concentrate on Absolutely. hitting. So pretty Absolutely. cool for the, the final segment here on today's show. So let's get in, let's talk about what exactly we are in fact going to be discussing. Now Microsoft recently announced that it has agreed to acquire LinkedIn with some 433 million users in an all cash transaction for a jaw dropping price of $26.2 billion. A very bold move by Microsoft as the deal is its largest acquisition in the history of the company and the price is 7% of Microsoft's current market cap. Now, according to what Microsoft said after the acquisition, LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner said, uh, report to Microsoft CEO uh, Nadella, but LinkedIn will continue to operate independently and will retain its brand after the acquisition. So Scott, interesting to say the least, does this make sense right now? The I mean, just give me your thoughts on this acquisition. We'll sure. kind of get into it. At the high level, unquestionably, this makes sense. I mean, this makes a ton of sense. In fact, I think that every executive out there that could have possibly been a part of this is pretty jealous. Um, I think it caught everyone by surprise. I don't think there was anybody that predicted this sort of a, this, this deal. Um, but there are just so many ways that it does make sense. A couple of naysayers will cast, you know, stones at it and say that they overpaid, but you can never tell that until much later on. But I think this was a really great move by Nadella, and, and we'll talk about some of the opportunities to earn money out of it. Well, I was going to say, go, go into the opportunity. What is the opportunity here for Microsoft when yeah. we actually look at this? I think there are a lot. I mean, many have talked, I've, I've read a number of articles on this that, that analysts want to talk about the idea of enterprise social. Certainly bringing that in to kind of pair with the Yammer uh, and SharePoint is, is certainly one place where this plays. Um, you can look at the media and the publishing business that LinkedIn has started and have been very successful with not making money out of it, but in terms of getting authors and getting content, it's been really good for that, in fact. Um, but the point that I think is one of the most interesting um, is the idea of the kind of data as a service and the services model, uh, Tyler, that, that this brings. I think it's really, really, really a big opportunity for them. I was going to say, go into that a little bit more. What do you exactly do you mean by data as a service? Because I mean, we talked about data w with Lisa. We've talked about this on a consistent basis. Explain that a little bit more to me yeah. as a service. Sure. So. First of all, I think everybody understands that both software and hardware eventually become commoditized, right? Over time, and that I mean with the likes of, just I don't need to explain that here in this segment, but it becomes commoditized over time. Um, and if a company like Apple realizes that software and hardware becomes commoditized, then certainly Microsoft realizes that painfully so. Uh, but Apple even announced at their Q1 announcement that they are basically, they are, they are a services company. They want to be viewed as a services company, thinking about, I 
iTunes and the App Store and Apple Pay, all of these ways of capitalizing on the data that's there and being able to create a services model that doesn't have to essentially um, kind of eat itself as you can only replace your own products as opposed to being able to expand your market in a way that you can with services and have that kind of drive revenue with you. So what I think they get in this is if you think of the idea of um, the data and rich data that you have in LinkedIn and pairing that with things like Microsoft Dynamics now that they have, which is their CRM engine, and to be able to kind of capitalize on both of those that you have this access to data that's available. Every single salesperson out there has a window for LinkedIn open anyway, looking at all of that information. To be able to capitalize that, pull that into a product and make a real kind of services model out of that, I think is really compelling. So one of the things I want to ask you about, you know, we talked about Benioff earlier today, but go back to that. How does yeah. he kind of play into this situation here? Well, so we found out last week, in fact, that everybody was wondering kind of who bid up Nadella. Why did he pay such a premium for this? And actually, he wasn't bid up. In fact, um, Benioff has, has acknowledged that he was actually the first one in. He was set to buy, Salesforce was set to buy LinkedIn. Uh, and in fact, when LinkedIn went to go out, they had to basically go see if there were other bidders and they, they basically called on Nadella and said, um, you know, basically we're about to sell ourselves here and if you want in, you can be in. So I think here uh, is Satya Nadella coming back in and basically saying, touche back at you. You might've taken <laughs> demand from me according to my theory, yep. but I'm, I'm taking a much bigger piece back from you. Yeah, Benioff's just driving up the price nowadays. That's just kind of what he, he does. He wants to be in everything, and he was talking about this is just one of the most interesting times from an acquisition standpoint. There are so many deals out there to be made, and they've mentioned they're not winning all of them, but they are in a lot of them, I think. So one of the things I want to ask you, you know, what makes this possible for someone like Microsoft? I mean, you, this yeah. amount of money, that just seems crazy, but talk about the offshore part of all this, because it's yeah. really interesting. Alan Pell Sharps, one of, one of our analysts at Digital Clarity Group, mentioned this point, and um, coming from 451, where they study every single uh, acquisition, um, he's got a lot of insight here, is that a lot of these big companies like or Microsoft, they, they have a lot of, you know, they do a lot of work um, around the globe, and so therefore they have a lot of money offshore. And quite frankly, to repatriate that money costs them a whole lot of money in taxes, right? And so, in fact, this becomes a really great, a company like Microsoft that has billions and billions of dollars offshore right now and can't really put that to use in a way to be able to have an acquisition like this, even if you have to pay a premium, quite frankly, it's better than paying the tax that they would have otherwise paid. And so they actually don't really um, realize from a net standpoint the, the, the premium that they ended up paying. It becomes a cheaper way, in fact, for them. So correct me, is it, this seems kind of like the perfect kind of one-two punch, perfect combination, right? I mean, am I wrong in saying that? It just seems like everything in here is just perfect, really. Look, I, I think there are, again, many ways to make money. Think about the media side, think about the ad. You know, somebody pointed out, I, I wrote a blog about this on, on, on both our website, but also on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> Go figure, right? Sorry. <laughs> and um, one of the comments by another analyst who actually covers ad tech was that um, his point was Microsoft uh, owns a big share of AppNexus, which is a big kind of ad tech platform. Uh, and um, so the synergies that can possibly happen there, where LinkedIn really hasn't been able to make the turn to be really profitable from, um, from an advertising standpoint. Mm -hmm. They haven't gotten that model exactly right, but I think that Microsoft could do that. And the kind of synergies with AppNexus can help. So between advertising dollars, between the media play, between the services play that I like to talk about, between pulling it and integrating into their other uh, applications, whether it's in Office 365. So talk about that, that, the integration part, because that's the part that's interesting as well. I, yeah, you look, I mean, again, it becomes a, the data becoming available and made available through their many applications. I mean, they are sitting on the desktops of you know lots and lots of enterprise users, uh, whether it be Office 365, whether it be SharePoint, as we reviewed earlier, or Amy reviewed earlier. Um, lots and lots of possible places where that you can go, or Dynamics, as I mentioned, where you can go and surface this really insightful data and make good use of it. I think that's, I think that's really, really, really compelling and everyone is jealous. And um, the, the nice thing is, look, number one is, I think overall this is creating a nice story arc for Microsoft. Um, who would have thought that you could turn a ship like that? I mean, yeah. not that it, you know, it wasn't exactly the Titanic. It wasn't going down per se, but we all know that Microsoft wasn't the most innovative. And I think that Nadella is really doing a major turn on a company like that in fairly short time. Um, that's, that's one thing that's really nice about this. And um, I, I think that 
everybody knows that LinkedIn is a kind of a major player, has a lot of data that everybody wants access to, and now that they own that, um, and the fact that Satya has actually had the, the LinkedIn CEO is going to report to him, but apparently it's still going to run as a business, it's going to keep its own brand, uh, yeah. and I think that's also um, great for those uh, LinkedIn employees as well, that they know they're going to be able to continue to innovate fueled by the purse strings of a Microsoft, um, where quite frankly, look, uh, a lot of them were being paid. I saw this as an article last week. A lot of them were being paid in stock incentives. And um, when their stock has taken such a hit, uh, it was kind of hard to figure out um, how, if these guys are going to stick around or not. So anyway, <laughs> I think there's a lot to, to in this deal. It makes a lot of sense for both sides for many reasons. Very cool. Perfect stuff. Scott, I, I think... Uh, today's show. Pretty awesome, I'm sorry to say that. Great content, Lisa was great. The fact yeah. that we're here, I mean, we're sitting inside, the, literally, they're gonna be taking BP behind us in shortly. I mean, this is one of the- <laughs> We should get out of the way for that, say. by the way, but yeah. So we gotta go, it. we gotta get out of the way. So <laughs> that'll do it for Scott and I today. Uh, make sure to catch our next episode because we do have another fantastic location just lined up. Can't let you know where it is just yet, but I promise awesome. you, you're going to love it. You definitely will. And you can also find more about upcoming episodes and watch previous episodes on our website at cms-connected.com. Obviously, we have a lot of great breaking news on there as well, so make sure you go and take a look at that. Four, big thanks again to our sponsors, Digital Clarity Group, as well as Falcon Software, for putting on this show and making this entire thing happen. Big thank you to Amy Martin, as well as Lisa Welchman, and of course, for Scott Lewer, I'm Tyler Piper. But until next time, we say get connected, stay connected, right here on CMS Connected.